Good morning, my name is John Nisley. I'm the planner with the City of New Ulm. Today we're going to be taking a tour of the New Ulm Police Department. Right now we're standing in front of the Law Enforcement Center, and this is how New Ulm works. Good morning. Good morning. I am here with Commander Barstead, Commander of the New Elm Police Department. Um, Commander, can you tell us a little bit about where we're at? Absolutely. We're in the reception area of the Law Enforcement Center. The Law Enforcement Center serves uh, both uh, the Brown County Sheriff's Office as well as the New Elm Police Department. Uh, this is the area where the public often comes to us sometimes to report crimes or other incidences of concern as well as to obtain uh, reports and that types of thing from our agency. About so, how many people a day do you see up in this area? Uh, it varies greatly. Um, there's days where we see very few, generally on the weekends, and then there's times where we could easily have, say, 50 to 70 people approach the two agencies here right at this very window. Okay. So, so how, how many people does the New Home Police Department employ? At full staff, we would have 25 sworn staff. That would include our chief, myself, our uh, patrol uh, sergeants and uh, the rest of the patrol staff as well as our three investigators all work right out of this building here. Wow, that's great information. Can we go inside? <laughs> Absolutely. Good morning, I'm here with uh, Sheriff Jason Seidel of the Brown County uh, Sheriff's Office. Mr. Seidel, can you tell us where we're at? Yeah. I'm Jason Seidel with the Brown County Sheriff's Office and we are in the Brown County Sheriff's Office 911 Center. This is where we take all the 911 calls. We also take all administrative lines also that come into the county and non-emergency lines or calls also that come in. We do um, paging and also radio service for as far as for all of the ambulance, fire departments and law enforcement for the whole county, which includes Comfrey, Springfield, Sleepy Eye, New Ulm, Hanska and all the points in between. Sheriff, can you tell us, you know, give us a rough idea of how many calls you get in a day? Uh, we get about 28,000 a year, so some days can be a little bit less, some days can be a little bit more. Um, if you get like a, an accident or something along the lines of bad weather, we're going to get a lot more calls come in. But if you have a little bit slower day, nothing really going on, the calls will be minimal. Okay, and are they only emergency calls that you get in this? We get both emergency calls and also regular business administration line calls. So um, emergency would be something that needs immediate attention, life or death. So, um, and all other calls should be directed, routed to the non-emergency lines. All right, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Right, we are now inside the office of the New Orleans Police Department. I'm here again with Commander Barstead. Commander Barstead, um, I know you have a number of different rooms here that you use for different purposes. Can you tell us what we're going to be taking a look at? Absolutely. The next thing we'll take a look at, John, is going to be uh, one of our interview rooms. We have a couple of different uh, interview rooms uh, to utilize. One we use here is just inside of our reception area where we can gather some general information regarding a matter or an incident that might uh, concern someone. Uh, and then we have another one where we actually sit down and we will interview people and we can record those conversations. And I can show you to that right now. Sounds okay. great. So John, this is uh, the interview room that we had just completed here at the police department. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we have, uh, this is an area we might bring somebody, uh, speak to them about something that occurred. When we enter the room, things begin to record automatically, so we have those uh, for, for reference when we're completing our reports. Wow, so this is, this is a brand new room for you guys. Um, no, yes. You're no longer just having to write everything down. You have different technologies that you're using. Yes, our, our officers and investigators will still be taking notes during their regular interviews of individuals, uh, but everything is uh, recorded as well, so we have that without having to start up a lot of equipment. Great, thank you. Nice to meet you, Chief Barkert. Um, so today we're exploring the New Orleans Police Department, its sure. functions, um, and I just have a couple questions for you. So first of all, when did you become Chief of Police for the City of New Orleans? November 2018. Okay, 
And I know you have a focus on the New Ulm Police uh, and the New Ulm area. Do you guys work outside of, of this area at all? Do you work with other communities? Well, we try to work with our neighboring communities in, in essentially state of Minnesota wide. Primarily though, we're, you know, obviously within the city of New Ulm and then um, we try to assist our neighboring agencies if we're, if we're contacted. Okay, I know there has been, um, you know, in the newspapers, we see a lot about the drug task force. Are you involved with that at all? Yes, I'm on the board of directors with that um, as the police chief. Every, every uh, we, we have a joint powers agreement, okay. and it, so that would cover Brown Line, Redwood, and Renville counties. Um, we also provide emergency response unit coverage from that task force. So Chief, I know you have to deal a lot with the police department side of things, but as the Chief of Police, are there other emergency services you have to deal with uh, within the City of New Ulm or even Brown County for that matter? Well, part of my responsibility as the Police Chief is uh, the Emergency Management Director for the City. Oh. And with that, I work very closely with the committee. Uh, we meet the third Thursday of every month at 8.30 um, at the Fire Department, and we're working with our our other agencies, our other law enforcement partners. Um, in law enforcement with emergency management, we always talk, we don't want to be working in silos, we want to be working with everybody, um, trying to accomplish the same goal, which is public safety. Sure. Um, so when we're doing that, it gives us really an opportunity to, to work with everybody, to communicate, try to forecast, predict maybe what the next challenge is, mm -hmm. and prepare for it. So like right now, one of our major concerns that we have is, is flooding. Considering that New Alms on the Minnesota River and also the Cottonwood River, it's actually where they meet, um, flooding is a common problem that, that we encounter. And it seems like it's becoming a little bit more frequent. Well, it sure seems like as the chief of police for the city of New Alms, you have to wear a lot of hats. So thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So John, this is the, uh, our police squad room. Uh, this is where our, our patrol staff primarily works uh, when they're indoors. Uh, they do a lot of report writing. You can see there's a number of computers around. They've all got uh, you know workstation and that type of thing. Uh, generally, we have anywhere from uh, at most three or four people in here at a time, um, as that's who happens to be on shift. Okay, could you give me an, any idea of how you know how long do the officers spend in here writing reports and things versus? actually on the road doing patrols? That can vary quite a bit. Uh, the, the more calls for service we have, generally uh, the more report writing our officers oh. have to do and that would involve them being in here uh, to complete those reports. On a day where it's more all uh, patrol based activity, then they're spending the overwhelming majority of their time uh, out and about in the squad cars and patrolling the community. Great. So we generally have uh, approximately 10,000 calls for service per year. Uh, that would involve um, crimes against the persons, uh, such as assaults, uh, crimes against property, which would be thefts and vandalisms. I would back up the fire, uh, fire department on a number of calls for service. Uh, we're generally the first to respond when there's a medical call in the community as well. Um, so not all of those calls uh, require an officer to write a report. Um, sometimes we're, we simply can issue citations instead of writing reports oh. for incidents as well. Uh, but that's kind of the, this is the, kind of the patrol staff's general home here when we're inside the building. You know, Commander, one thing I find interesting is uh, I think everybody thinks of the police department as in the squad cars doing patrols, crimes. You guys also have to work with the city code quite a bit and enforcing some of the city code, right? Absolutely, we do. Uh, there's a number of city ordinances that, uh, that we're uh, responsible to enforce. One of them being, being our blight ordinances, or 8.63, uh, is the, the ordinance number for that. And so we, our officers do spend a bunch of time in here mailing out notices of those violations. Um, talking with individuals to try to make certain that those matters get taken care of before citations arrive or potentially issuing citations for those properties that don't get taken care of. Wow, this is great information. Okay. Thanks for sharing that with us. Very welcome. So John, this, is, this room here is what we refer to as uh, the Law Enforcement Center Training Room. It's also uh, backs up as the Emergency uh, Operations Center oh. in the event of an emergency management type situation. Um, our officers meet in here for ongoing trainings uh, in larger groups 
and uh, our, our officers are required to have continuing education credits uh, of 16 hours per year. Uh, we generally, for our, our officers, we're providing 12 to 15 hours a month, generally, on average, for ongoing training for our personnel. Wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of extra training for your officers. I'm sure everybody in the community would be happy to hear that. There's a lot of changes taking place in the law enforcement profession right now, um, and it's important for us to stay up on those those changes and be ready to serve our community the best we can. Oh, that's great information. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm oh. here today with uh, Police Sergeant uh, Brady Murphy. Uh, Mr. Murphy here is also part of the team that runs this emergency response unit. Um, and Brady, would you tell us a little bit about um, this unit, some of the functions it has, and, and where you where you would use this, what type of situation? Okay, this is a, a kind of a repurposed military vehicle that we got through the, the military, the government. We use this every time our emergency response unit, which is a SWAT team, every time that team is activated, we use this unit. It's completely armored, so it's the safest way to get our personnel up to a scene, up to a house, and the other side of that coin, if we need to evacuate injured people from a scene, we use this also. We've got cots and litters in the back, so it's, it's, we use it for basically safe transport of our personnel and injured folks. Okay. Excellent. So it says Brown, Lyon, Redwood, and Renville. Are those the counties that this unit serves? Yeah, the, it's called the BLRR Emergency Response Unit. It's a multi-agency SWAT team made up of those four counties, as well as the New Ulm Police Department, the Marshall Police Department, and the Redwood Falls Police Department. Okay, and we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, you're an officer and you're part of this team. Um, even when you're off duty, you're always part of this team, is that right? Yes, correct. We've been called out at two in the morning, six in the morning, lunchtime. At, whenever an agency gets into a situation where they need the additional resources, they make the call and all of us that are able to respond, we respond to that scene. All right, thanks. Um, maybe could you show us a few of the features on the vehicle, point out a couple of things like what What's this big spear right here? This, the big spear looking thing, that is our, our door ram. We use it if for a way to safely breach a door. And okay. if we're trying to get into a house, maybe it's been barricaded. Maybe we need to get in there quickly to rescue injured personnel or hostages. We use that to open the door. Um, very heavy. We've yet to find a door that it won't open. Kind of the master key. Uh, this, this vehicle is also equipped. It's completely armored. We've got a PA system to try to make contact with individuals. It's got your typical lights like a lot of police vehicles have. It's got openings on the top where we can get out for a better vantage point just being at that height. So when you uh, receive a call for this, this type of service or use of this vehicle, do you have all your equipment already in there, or how does that work? Uh, we have three response vehicles, two converted ambulance and this one. Each one has a little bit different load as far as the equipment that it carries. This one carries what we call a throw phone, which is a way that we can put a phone into a, a house or a building to communicate with the suspects inside. Our other vehicles, they may carry gas or chemical munitions. All of our vehicles carry first aid equipment for injured officers or injured citizens, injured suspects, wherever we might need it. Okay. So we, we bring everything on every call because we never know, the situations change so quickly, we never know what we'll need exactly. So we bring everything every time. Okay, so just one more question. Give me an idea, how many times have you used this vehicle? Um, we've used it, we use it every time we get called. Okay. As for the Ram we've used a couple times so far okay. in the last, I'd say, year, but every, every single time we get called out, this vehicle's there. Wow, okay. Because it's the safest way to get officers to the scene and then to get us back away, or like I said, to rescue injured individuals. All right, well, thanks for showing us all this. What a fascinating piece of equipment, you guys. All right, we are inside the um, police department storage unit. And here again, I'm with uh, Officer uh, Brady Murphy, and he is gonna go through and show us some of the pieces of tactical equipment uh, that he might use on the SWAT team. The, the main piece of equipment we use on every call out, every deployment is our body armor. It's a little different than the ones we wear on the street. You can see it's got some different equipment holders. We've, we all carry 
a pretty in-depth first aid pouch to deal with any injuries that we might get ourselves or another team member. We run a different communication setup, more headphones and suspended mic than our typical squad radios. This is the, the plate that we wear in it. Oh, wow. It's, it makes for a long day when you're wearing that, <laughs> but it's pretty substantial. These, we wear helmets on every call out, so it's our typical ballistic helmet. This one, I have my night vision optic on it, so depending on what our mission is, what we need to do, we may use the night vision to approach a scene if we're going in on foot, trying to stay undetected. And that's typical to a military load. It just flips out in front of your left eye for me since I'm right eye dominant. We'll use that. We use our typical duty issued handguns when we're on SWAT call out. We all have the same ones. Most of us when we're working will use a, our dedicated ERU rifle. It's a little different setup than what's on our typical patrol rifles. It's a little shorter barrel for maneuverability. Our whole team runs suppressors because when we do our trainings and everything, we're shooting in close proximity to one another, so it just saves your hearing protection big time. And we also run an infrared optic, or an infrared laser right here, so if we are under night vision, we can illuminate the scene with that. And we have basically a laser sight on that unit as well. And then for daylight, just our normal typical optic right there. Wow. So Sergeant Murphy, you have a, a lot of extra equipment here. Do you have any idea how much this stuff weighs? Overall, when we're wearing full kit with the rifle, it's minimum 60 pounds, wow. I would say. 60 and extra pounds. Do you have to do extra training just to get in shape to do this kind of thing? It, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> you, it's, you can tell folks who aren't used to moving underweight. They get tired a lot quicker. Their knees get sore. Their lower backs get sore. So it, it does take a little extra work outside of just our normal monthly trainings to stay in shape to move because we need to be able to move very quickly under all that weight and still respond correctly, shoot accurately, everything that goes with it. We're, we're expected to be able to do that on a moment's notice, so you have to keep yourself in reasonably good shape, I would say. All right. Well, thank you for showing us all this stuff. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm here with Officer Kister, and uh, Officer Kister works with the New Orleans Police Department's K-9 unit, and um, we're here in front of his vehicle, and he's going to show us a few features about this vehicle, um, but one thing that I've always wondered is, you know, I know um, you have your dogs in the back with you yep. all of the time, um, so obviously you're not transporting any but you might arrest or anything no, in, nope, in the back. No, except for that, like a normal squad car. Um, okay. So what's different about this canine squad car is, as opposed to a regular squad car is we have a, the, it's called a door popper or hot popper. Um, so certain situations come up where we need to get the dog out immediately. Um, we have both a, a button on our vest and a button in the squad car um, that we're able to open this door automatically. Wow. Pop it opens up. Okay. So, Yep, we don't utilize it too often, but there is certain scenarios where, you know, hey, you need to get him out ASAP, and, or we're running after a bad guy, and now we need uh, uh, canine assistance. Open the door, he'll come up and join, join us. All right. So. I see you might have, it must be a dish for some water back there. <laughs> Officer Kister, would you explain some of the differences between your canine uh, back here and, and a normal patrol vehicle? Yep, so first of all, um, you know, we're not going to transport anybody back here. This is meant solely for the dog. Um, so we have his water dish. We also have temperature controlled, heat and cooled um, that come up from up here. Um, we do that to accommodate for, uh, like my dog is a German Shepherd. Um, you know, he has a lot of hair on him. So in the summertime, he does get extremely hot. Sure. So we need to keep him cool during uh, or after he's done working, doing his whatever uh, yeah, we're doing for that day, even training too. Um, and what's cool about this is it has three different temperature settings around the cage. Um, I'm not sure exactly where they are, but uh, it, it keeps track of temperatures, um, I think it's like every minute, um, it updates. Um, and if it gets above 90 degrees, it'll roll all the windows down on the squad car. It'll actually do an SOS uh, over the horn um, so that hopefully you're around and can hear it and come and uh, you know, pull your dog down and, and go from there. Interesting. So. Okay. 
Is there anything in the back you wanted to show us? So the back is kind of the same setup as the other squad cars. Um, you know, it has this little gate you can open, uh, but mine is obviously filled with canine stuff. Um, so we have leashes, tracking harnesses, um, you know, sleeves for decoys, uh, toys, obviously, um, and then just different uh, like scent detection stuff, narcotics detection stuff. Um, then I'm on the ERU team as well, so I have my ERU bag, uh, the medical equipment like you saw Sergeant Murphy explain as well. Um, and always some good cleaning stuff just sure. in case accidents <laughs> happen. Sure. So. Well, thanks, Officer Kister. I think uh, next we're actually going to meet your dog. Yes. Uh, Officer Kister, can you tell us a little bit about Hank and how long you've had him? Yep. So Hank, uh, he's two years old, just turned two in January. Um, he's originally from Poland, um, and I've had him for just about a year now. Um, we went to training uh, up in the cities in, in March. Um, it's a three-month training up there. Um, but he's been living in my house and driving around the squad car with me ever since. So. Okay, and I, you said he came from Poland. Um, is there a special kind of police dog that you're looking for? There's a certain breed. Okay. Um, we don't pick them out. The department doesn't pick them out. Um, the um, trainer that we went to has connections over in Poland and all these other places. Um, and he, he looks for certain breeds of dogs. Okay. Certain genetics. Sure. And does... Um, does your dog, I mean, does he do, does he just do chases or does he do like drug detection or what kind of things can your dog do? Yeah, so he's certified to the NPCA with uh, substance detection, um, criminal apprehension, he assists with that. Um, also like evidence searches, uh, like if you're chasing after somebody and he were to throw like a, a, a weapon or, you know, like a hat or something, he can, he can find those as well. Um, as well as like building searches, he assists with those. Okay. Um, and yeah, like cr criminal apprehension, stuff like that. Can he help with search and rescue and that type of thing too? Uh, he's not, m yes and no. Um, if we get to the person soon enough, uh, we can follow their trail, follow their track, and hopefully catch them. Um, but he's not a cadaver dog by any means. Okay, got yeah. it. So um, he looks pretty mellow right now. Yes. Um, can you give me something, like what turns on his switch? Is it just what you command him to do? Um, more or less, yeah, like toys get him going, um, but there's also just certain scenarios that we've kind of set up to where he knows, okay, now it's go time. And then, uh, you know, it's easy to turn that switch off. We give him a toy, put him in the back of the squad car, and he'll just calm down, relax, and go back to being just a normal dog. Sure. So I know, you know, m myself having dogs, I know dogs uh, take a lot of care um, and training. Mm -hmm. How often do you train with Hank? Uh, I try to squeeze in an hour every shift. Um, we have a 16-hour requirement that we're supposed to as canine handlers every month, um, but at least try to do a 16-hour, or excuse me, a one-hour shift. Okay. So um, you have Hank. Is there another canine uh, unit in the city? Yes. Uh, there's a, a senior handler, uh, Eric Byro, and his dog is Dino. Um, he's been on the, he's been, Dino's been working with uh, uh, Eric for about four years now. Okay. So, you know, I, I know um, all of us, see a dog, but I think for the police department and people who work with uh, dogs, this is another officer to you, is it not? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. It's an extension, extension of me, so. All right. Yep. Well, thank you for sharing all this uh, information on Hank. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Well, we're here again with Commander Barstead, and I just wanted to say thank you, Commander Barstead. Yeah, absolutely. For, for showing us around the police department and all the different things you guys do. And thank you for joining us on How New Home Works.